Good evening and welcome to the January 28th, 2014 special meeting of the Town of Wareham Board of Selectmen and Sewer Commissioners. We're meeting tonight in conjunction with the school committee and the FinCom. So at this moment, uh, we'll wait for the other two bodies to open their meetings. I'd like to open up the meeting of the, uh, the joint meeting between the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, and the FinCom. I'll take a motion to open the meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are open. We won't be opening the meeting as we are one member short of opening, so therefore, we're just observing. Okay. Uh, just so everybody knows what's going on, uh, the, the two bodies plus some members of the FinCom are gathered here to uh, discuss the latest set of numbers regarding the 2014 budget. We've already had the department hearings uh, before the FinCom. Uh, we have those before us. We have also a document, Town of Wareham 10-Year Snapshot, or as I call it, the way we were, comparing fiscal 2005 to fiscal 2014 projected to show where the differences are. Uh, we also have something from Administrator Sullivan uh, that talks about the local aid assessments and does a comparison between last year and this year, and also the local aid uh, estimates themselves. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Mr. Sullivan just to speak first to these numbers and give us a general overview of what we're looking at. Thank you very much. The first document that we will pull is the Town of Wareham 10-year snapshot. Uh, in going through this, you'll see the first column is the FY14 projected. Second column is the FY2005. That is what was voted at town meeting, including the October adjustments. Uh, you'll see over the, the 10 years, the growth in the real estate taxes, uh, two and a half authorized. Growth has shrunk during, uh, even when uh, 2005 started, that was probably towards the tail end of when uh, real estate started to go down. So I believe the few years before that, we were probably looking at growth rate somewhere, growth uh, dollar somewhere in the eight to $900,000 range. Um, if we go to the next line, you'll see the intergovernmental transfers, which is the, the chapter 78. Uh, over that time, we've received an additional 1.3 million. However, if you remember at the time, there was school construction aid of about 1.17. Uh, charter schools, the, the, those funds have increased by about 137. So if you netted that out, we're looking at about $438,000 in increased aid. The, uh, the local government's pretty interesting in that uh, if you go through it, you're looking at about a $103,000 reduction. Estimated local receipts and reimbursements. They have essentially stayed the same. One of the big reasons is motor vehicle excise tax. In 2005, people had newer vehicles. We, it was before we really hit the lost decade, if you will. And uh, you can see that at that point, you were looking at approximately <coughs> 2.68 million in motor vehicle excise tax, whereas now we receive in budget roughly 2.13. So the difference between the two is 226,000. Here's one of the big items that, uh, that you know, wasn't really a prudent measure and we don't do it today is in the available funds. You'll see that the FY 2005 budget was balanced with 1.3 plus million dollars worth of free cash. The other large item, uh, the difference is the water pollution control, you'll see that they had an admin fee in there as well of about 922000 at the time, which was uh, approximately a $400,000 difference than what we have from the health insurance and uh, the fringe benefits. So is there any questions on the revenues from the snapshot? What's, just briefly, the CADR and, yep. All right. So when you look at that, you'll see uh, what, sort of, what sort of the growth is. If uh, every year property taxes, when you include the authorized to 2.5% plus the new growth, uh, you're approximately 3.6%. The cherry sheet aid, 0.2%. 
increasing every year and our local local uh, receipts and reimbursements negative 0.4 percent is the uh, is the growth and uh, our available funds negative 11.8 percent so this is um, obviously I won't go down line by line throughout the whole uh, through all general si government side but you can see what uh, what some of the growths are and what some of the reductions the audit has has increased um, substantially general services have had a large decrease uh, the difference and I want everybody to remember the differences between budgeted and uh, what was actually expended could be a could be a large difference. Our IT costs have gone up, and you'll see that's mainly on the technology expenses side. Um, and in going going through this, one of the largest decreases is in municipal maintenance, 22% uh, overall, or a two point negative 2.4% uh, CAGR. So uh, that's from wages and also in expenses. Our snow and ice has increased as uh, the cost of the storm go, storms go up. Police wages on that same, excuse me, if you go about, I would say one third of the way down, you'll see that the police uh, are growing approximately 1% per year and have grown uh, 420,000 or 11, 11%, mainly on the capital, which is the vehicles and the uh, the wages which was when they had hired new officers so as we continue on you'll see uh, the next line is the library that's large it's a 55 percent overall reduction or a negative 7.7 percent we know that uh, last year's and uh, the fy14 reduction for them so overall uh, on the general government side if you look at it the uh, the expenses of capital have increased by one percent or have grown by 0.1 percent annually and the uh, wages have decreased by 218,000 or negative three percent or a growth rate of negative 0.3 percent uh, as we go through uh, you'll see the school there was an an increase I think the the annual is 1.4 percent but the non net school spending which is the buses has decreased 2 percent or negative 0.2 percent the uh, decrease has been in just the non net school spending line so a total of uh, 15 percent or 1.4 the fixed cost the debt has uh, significantly gone down by 66% or negative 10.3% annually. Um, and so obviously you'd see the same things in the debt of the interest of the short and long term. Uh, general liability insurance has actually, believe it or not, decreased. And that, that was an interesting one to, to look at. But that's, uh, I don't know why that would be unless we've made, we made some changes. I know that we do receive Maya reimbursements, so that was interesting. The reserve fund, if you look in the uh, in FY14 budgets and such, the reserve fund is actually kept in the general government side, and for FY14 that was 75,000. Um, the rest of these are small. Sick leave bonus. It was kept as an employee benefit in FY 2005. That is uh, in FY 14 shows up in the general side, general government side. Um, here, are, here are the employee benefits and really the large ones. If you look, the retirement contribution since 2005 has increased one million four hundred thousand dollars, or 98 percent, compounding annual growth of a rate of seven percent. Uh, the workers' comp has increased, uh, compensation insurance has increased 180,000 or 70 percent, or growing approximately 5.4 percent. Unemployment, that's really, it's going to depend on whatever year you're, you're a part of. Medical insurance is interesting, uh, 4.2 million it was in 2005. FY14, we'd budget 6.7. Right, that's a $2.5 $2, $2. million increase, or 60 percent. 
uh, comp uh, growth of 4.8 percent and the uh, life insurance and FICA have all grown approximately 2.9 to 3.3 percent so employee benefits have increased uh, 4.3 million or 68 percent or an annual growth compound growth rate of uh, 5.3 percent so that was a lot to go through at once just a quick comment um, something that doesn't show up here directly as a line item but on the cherry sheets and maybe you're going to get to oh, it yeah it's the last page <laughs> the on the cherry yeah. sheets there's an item under the assessments um, which is retired in, uh, teachers health insurance so it's another health insurance component um, back certainly when a, Pat and I were on the FinCom that number was two or three hundred thousand dollars a year it's now 1.2 1.3 million dollars another piece of the health care problem in this country yeah, if you go to the final page on the back. Have, have you done this with just straight headcount by department? This Two. same comparison so we know how many people are in each? Yeah, you'd actually have to extrapolate that data. Uh, I don't have the, I haven't been able to do that, nor do I have the time. I know that we have. Personnel uh, records? Selectman Whiteside has been working out. Actually, our record is the annual town report, which doesn't just list employees and their um, what they've made for salary, including overtime. Then it is up to you to match that person's name to their department. So you need somebody with some memory of the town. <laughs> so we're, it's a worthwhile exercise. And the Selectman Whiteside, I've actually asked to work on that. Who I'm not saying she's had tons of history, but she knows some, <laughs> some, some parts of the town. So. To your point, Tom, I think going forward, it would be good if we could get the annual it's reports compiled in that fashion. So-and-so, how much department worked for? Yep. It's just one more line for the department head to identify to the clerk in preparing the town report. Was it was the town about 3% smaller, 2% smaller? Head count for the town. It was about a thousand people difference in terms of um, census. Two percent. The town or the t are you speaking in uh, You're residents? You're talking about the, the census, right? Yeah. According the whole, to the census. Yeah. About five percent. It's like four You can't just do that. Excuse me. Um, the town clerk. What she does is she prints the summary payroll account. So in order for her, I've already talked with Judy um, Lausanne, in order for somebody to be identified, I would have to understand um, a whole lot more about <laughs> the school system's way of accounting for people than I do. I, it, it, it's a, it, it doesn't just, it's not going to be able, it's not going to be something that Marianne or the clerk or whoever prepares the annual report is going to be able to do very easily. Yeah, it, it's an excellent exercise and something we need to go forward because how, how do you compare year to year when you have, if you look back a decade, I'm sure people thought they would know everything about their own departments. And uh, I think we only have about uh, two or th two department heads left from that, from that era. Another way of, of looking at it, because I've been looking at this, I have a spreadsheet at home, as I was mentioning to Derek, that goes back to fiscal year 2001. Um, if you take all of the increased revenue since 2001, literally 50% of all of that increased revenue from all sources has gone to employee benefits. That's how you manage the town, the headcount. You got them. And if you look at the number of employees, I don't know whether you did a current headcount, but the, the headcount in 2005 was just a little over 1,000 people. Yeah, if you looked from the, um, the breakdown of the departments, the Finance Committee for the first time have this year, where it breaks out and shows each, uh, each position in that department, and then gives a headcount per department and per general side of the government. So that's one of the things we want to, that's actually going to be 
part of the town report, I believe, in the in the end, and it can help make future decisions. So. And shared with other other towns, compared with other towns, and things of that nature. What do you mean, Tom? Well, I mean, how is Carver, Rochester, Bourne, what do, what do they look like from a headcount point of view by department? What, yeah, you'll, you'll want to find like communities, um, try and go, yeah, I would compare budget size plus uh, population, and there's a, there's a few to really come down with, the, with like communities. Um, you know, obviously Carver's, Carver's police and school department would be substantially different than mm -hmm. what we, we would have. Uh, but if we go to page six, and this is what uh, Mr. Sweat was alluding to, the county and state assessments in FY 2014, 2.4 million. It had been uh, 1,026,000 in 2005, and you're looking at almost a $1.4 million increase. Uh, veterans assessments have gone up 259% uh, or, or growing annually about 13.6%. So these, uh, you know, if we, we saw there was a little increase in, in state aid and it completely went away. So the, um, the other interesting item is if you look under articles, the Upper Cape Cod Tech in FY 2005 had been a little over 1.7 million and we just... Uh, <laughs> don't look at me. That wasn't very nice. <laughs> in FY... Uh, <laughs> In uh, FY14, we're looking at just under $3 million. So it's increased 75% or um, the, the annual growth of 5.9. Bob wants to make sure everyone can hear me. We'll put that one out of service and use this one. Uh, but that's uh, when you go through all of this, this is what you're looking like, looking at. Uh, obviously, there's more information to take out of this. But this is the document that I think everybody could look for and use as a tool to see where we've been. And this will help us make our future projections yeah. as well. For students, the best way to look at So if we look at the next document it is the town of Wareham draft FY15 budget. And we're going to call it budget number three. It was high. Has 12814 as the date. So I'm going to ask that everybody turns it to the back side. Page six of six. This is what we're all looking at for the FY15 requested funding. Our deficit projected for FY15 is two million nine hundred eight thousand. $525. Again, $2,908,525. Four dollar bottle of water. <laughs> the, uh, we received one of the big changes. We've been going off of a number of approximately 2.5 million. We did receive the first uh, First local aid assessments and uh, revenues. You've been given that double-sided paper. Uh, when you go through that, it's uh, you'll be able to see see what the differences were. So, uh, you know, we can go through the revenues. We can go through the expenditures. We can go through every single line item. But I guess the uh, the question is. 2.9 million, what are we going to do? Is, is Upper Cape the real number? I have not been given a real number from them. We won't have that until probably March, that's yeah. what I'm understanding. No. Uh, I know that we've been, we've estimated some numbers before and had to change when it's coming higher. So let's consider this a conservative number if it comes in lower. 2.8 million for a deficit. So. And I'll open up to anybody that wants to go over anything, ask any question, has any ideas, or where we want to go from here. And that wasn't proper English, so I shouldn't say that with the school. <laughs> Any 
anything maybe before we open it up? Or should we just open it? We can okay. give you a brief overview of the okay. school. Um, our proposed budget amount will be $27,704,474. This would be a 3% increase over the FY14 budget. And I would turn it over to Michael then for more detail, additional details. Thank you very much. So we started, we put together a level service budget, so assuming no changes, and that put us in a just under a 6% increase in FY14. So we went back to the drawing board and a number of the number of proposals to make reductions to arrive at the number the superintendent outlined. So as well as making savings on supplies and materials, we're looking at reconfiguring our elementary schools, including closing the preschool, the East Wareham Elementary School, we're reorganizing special education department. Mike, please use the mic. Sorry. <coughs> So I'll start again with the reduction. So we're making savings on supplies and materials, reducing from our level service budget, as well as reconfiguring the elementary schools and closing the East Wareham Early Childhood Centre, which will, uh, will you know, achieve savings, most importantly through reduction in positions. We're also reorganising the special education department. And again, that achieves a saving through reduction in positions as well as some supplies and materials and a few other modest and a few other uh, staff reductions. And that those savings that amounts to a reduction in our budget of just under well, around seven hundred and sixty five thousand dollars. It cuts sixteen positions and that's what gets us down to the gets us down to the, the increase that the superintendent outlined. Thank you. I mean, I think that what uh, what Derek said before about pretty much opening it up, and I think that you said it kind of perfectly, we're looking at 2.9, so what are we going to do about it? And, um, you know, I was hoping that we would come here today because um, we all have, I think, dissected different parts of this budget. I think that we have formed either public or private opinions regarding the, the budget and the 2.9, and again, that's not derogatory whatsoever, just I know that I have an opinion about the 2.9, which was 2.4 or 2.5 yesterday. <coughs> um, so what I was hoping to accomplish today, this could just be about communicating to the community what the problem is, um, but we also, I think, are responsible for, with those formed opinions or with ideas, you know, we all read the newspapers, we all read the blogs, we all, you know, talk to constituents, young and old, and so there are ideas that people have um, that, that I think are important to get on the table and to basically scribe them, to, to write them down, to have um, one or two or three ideas that we ask our town leaders, the town administrator and the superintendent, to be able to go and really dive into those. And we're talking about, we know that cuts need to happen. And we, the superintendent and the town administrator probably have ideas where the line items are and it's going to be devastating, but they know that they're going to have to cut. So I'm not talking about so much cutting and going line by line, but I'm talking about truly restructuring or something big that will help restructure the budget or an idea that can help well, talking about new revenue coming to the town. You know, the, the bad words that we're all talk about, and there are some people that agree with it and some that don't. But true, just real ideas that we can put down on paper and then go back to the, and say to the super NTA, explore these more and come back and make recommendations on, on whether you think that it can work or not. We all can say what we think um, should be done, but it's ultimately, the responsibility of the TA and the superintendent to run their parts of this town. So if we do have ideas, it's important to get them out there so then maybe they can then say, all right, these are the three things, now let's work together, dive down into the details and come back and say, this is viable or it's not for this year. There's an another option that you didn't throw out there. And just so you know, I'll be the scribe for any ideas that come up. If I can ask one other person to be a volunteer, describe also so I make sure that my notes are correct. 
It would be increasing the funding of the town. Don't want to use the word override because I'll get shot. Um, or I'll have flat tires when I go outside. Um, in the preliminary work that I did for Mr. Sullivan um, from 2005 to the requested budget, there was a huge reduction in the number of people who work for this town in the general government side. Um, I can't, at one, um, there were 70 police officers. How many are there today? That's huge. 70 to 34, and that includes the chief, it included um, um, janitors and, you know, included everybody who reported on the police section. side. I'm sorry, it, it was 70, it is now? 34 is just the officers. Yes, you look at, it's 56, you look isn't it, or 58, something yeah, like that? I'd have to pull it up real quick. Well, you have to call, it's, so. it's, it's, you got, I mean, if you want to come to yeah, yeah. Well, it's what was in the 72. So what was in the 72 and then what was in the so I think 36? We in the 70. I don't have my. Yeah, it included all janitors. It included the IT people. It included. Um, well, municipal maintenance is down to 13. So right. And, and that number was nine. huge. It, well, and it had separate divisions. You know, there was a cemetery division. Yeah, there right. was a, you know, separate divisions that were, that were fully staffed. And we're now down to. Um, beyond bare bones and it it seems to me that um, well first of all 59 59, 59. Right. okay so it it's 11 in 10 years and um, that number is representative of what has happened to all of the town departments minus the school, I can't speak for the school numbers. How much further do we want to drive this town under before we recognize the fact that if you want something, you have to pay for it? There is no free lunch. All of those great little sayings. If we want a better blah, blah, we got to pay for the blah, blah. If we want cleaner streets, if we want more policemen on the street, we have to spend the money. And I, I don't, I honestly don't think that there are places to cut anymore. I, my personal opinion is that we're into the bone. We are not down to the bone. We are into the bone. Ready? Okay. I, I didn't go back to 2005 because, frankly, I think you can tell the story of just 13 to 15 if you really want to go at it. Um, our expenses have grown over that period of time by $4 million, and our revenues have increased by $1.7 million. What's really funny is if you take general government and school district and put them together, that represents less than 10% of the, of the growth in expenses. The majority of them comes from debt, benefits, offsets, and, and upper cape. That's really where it comes from. So when we talk about cutting the budget, we're cutting out of that 10%. We're not cutting out of the 90%. We're cutting out of the 10%. And you can only cut so far down in the 10%. And this year alone, if we try to carve $2.9 million out of this budget, we're going to do it again next year because these items are not going to stop growing. And they're going to grow. There's, there's a little bit of that when you, when you start reducing some headcount. But the reality is these things do not stop growing. So what we have to, and we call it on the FinCom, you might like this, we call it a revenue adjustment, which is really what, what we're looking at here. Is, and, and it's not something I think everybody in this room wants to do, but it's something at some point in time we're either going to have to do because we can't continue to do this every single year until we take the, the smallest piece and cut it down to nothing. And that's just, you know, we just can't do that. So we're working as a, as a finance committee starting tomorrow night, and I think we 
would like to put together a framework of how to fix this. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to get 100% buy-in from everybody at this table, but one of the things is it doesn't really matter what we want. It'll have to come down to a vote, and that's the people out there. And so what we have to do is be able to convince the people that this is what we want. We can throw all the highbrow analysis work at them, but what we really need to do is bring it into some sort of a visual aid and so they understand. And um, I think, you know, we've had a couple of discussions and, and we have one option, which is a $2.9 million uh, machete to the throat, basically. Or we're going to have to have another option where we're going to have to not just not just ask for the money, if you will, but we're going to have to show them that we have a level of physical responsibility to take that money and do the right things with it, and not just fix or uh, not just fix operations up to now, but we need to be able to show that we're going to be able to repair some of the damage. We don't have any money for infrastructures. We've obviously spent the last ten years avoiding it. But that's something we have to do. We have other issues we have to fix. So what we have to be able to do is tell the people, not only are we asking for this money, this is what we're going to do over the next five years. We can't just look at this as 2015. We have to look at this in five-year increments because if we don't, we're destined to fail. Mm -hmm. We've inherited a system which was broken before we inherited it. Uh, we inherited a system of funds coming in that was broken before we were in place. Um, we're so far behind, we're at a point where it's not a simple fix. I believe I heard on the radio today when I was coming in, uh, I think it was Falmouth, who we look at as a fairly wealthy community, shouldn't be having problems. Uh, they were announcing today that they were having a meeting tonight they're cutting 44 teachers and are going to try and see if they can get a debt exclusion or an override passed because they're going to have to cut basically to the bone on their budgets everywhere. Bourne has issues, which Bourne has always been well off. Um, we really don't have much choice because you have to have a balanced budget per se. And if you have a dollar, you can only spend a dollar. I believe what we're going to have to do is get to that balanced budget, cut out whatever things we have to cut, list them out and show people, if you want this, this is what it's going to cost per person, per household. There's no way around this. The problem is we don't have any time. Uh, I can sit there and tell you we have more revenue coming into the town, but it takes two and three years before you actually see anything come in. Uh, we have fringe benefits, which, um, you know, town employees for years, I remember way, way back when I was in Brookline in the 60s. Uh, town employees didn't make much money, but they got great fringe benefits because that was the deal. Nobody thought long term what those fringe benefits would cost 20, 30, 40 years down the road. They have killed us. Never mind killing us. They've killed us. They've virtually bankrupt every town and city in Massachusetts, probably in the country. Uh, we need to go look at our fringe benefits, our programs, to see where we can find some relief any way we can. Because no matter what we do, come next year we probably have another million plus just in that alone. If you look at the numbers over the last three years, it just doesn't work. I'm not doom and gloom, but I'm just saying is at this point here, as far as the town side goes, we're going to have to basically close departments down and say, people, if you want this, it's going to cost you a dollar fifty, you know, on your tax rate. The school department is going to probably have to do the same thing. Every department in town is going to have to do it. Um, there's no sense in sitting there trying to figure this or that. It's the bottom line. You got a dollar. We split it between all the different departments. At the end of the day, each department has to run it as best they can for that. And that's what they have to come up with. And then it's up to the town if they want anything more than that. Because we can't supply it to them, we don't have the money. And I don't know how to get out of the, the liabilities and the retirement programs and the benefits that we've locked ourselves into. The unions have us. I don't disagree with anything that... Um that Larry and Alan said, if nothing else comes out of tonight's meeting, I think we, we as three bodies should challenge the town administrator, the superintendent, and maybe the FinCom, if they'd like to accept that role, but certainly the town administrator and the, and the superintendent to develop, um, actually it's the town administrator with the assistance of the superintendent, to develop um, two budgets for town meeting. 
One is contingent upon an override, and one is if the override does not pass. That is not a unique thing to do. It is a part of the law that we can do precisely that. Um, a few years ago, um, I asked, so the, the data is maybe two, three years old. I asked John Foster to, to um, calculate what a million dollar override would cost the median household. And it was about a little over $60 a household. So if we wanted to solve the $3 million problem, um, we're talking about a little less than $200 for the median household. I think it's important to get those kind of facts because people have a way of, of making really big numbers. Now, I'm not suggesting that $200 is a really small number for some people, but it is what it is. And the advantage, of course, of a $3 million override is that it's perpetually there. And you don't end up with, as our finance chair was saying, you know, a crisis a year from now because that's bad for two reasons. One is you don't want to have annual crises. And second, the town says, I thought we solved the problem, um, and we didn't, so we've lost credibility. Um, and the third thing I would say is that if you do the simple calculation of difference between the current projections for FY15 and what the projections are for FY14, we're talking about a 6.1% increase in um, health care premiums. 6.1%. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of hearing the fact that the cost of health care is actually going down. That is the biggest BS line I've heard in a long time, and it's dangerous for people to be saying that, for perhaps for political reasons, on the national front. It isn't happening. The, 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 the curve may be slightly bending in the right direction, but it's continuing to go this way, and 6.1% is killing us, and the average over the last decade or so says that it's likely to kill us. And the fourth thing I'll say, which is um, perhaps radical, but that's never stopped me, I actually do not believe um, that we can really solve this problem if we really don't throw it at the institution that has caused this problem, which is we spend Let's call it twice. It's probably a little bit more than twice. We spend a little bit more than twice what virtually all the other developed countries in the world do on health care. It is not the town's fault. It is certainly not our employees' <coughs> fault that these costs are out of control. And by the way, everybody knows the morbidity mortality statistics say, we're not getting better care, folks. We're just spending twice as much or more as everybody else. A radical notion, which can't be solved tonight, can't even be explored tonight, is to radically diminish the number of people who are covered by health care by the town and use healthcare.gov as a way of getting coverage. Why is that? That is literally now, for the first time ever, possible. If I had said that a year ago, it would have been a non-starter because that didn't exist. The system of making sure that regardless of your age, your sex, your pre-existing condition, all of those things would have hurt terribly the individual employee. Now you can go to a website, not only get health coverage without being discriminated against for any of those reasons, you can get subsidized health care courtesy of the federal government. Well, if they haven't solved the problem of the fact that they're killing every city and town with the way health care is provided in this country, then they can at least take on the problem because, frankly, we can't survive as a town providing health care to all our employees, and it is not their fault. The Affordable Health Care Act fees for next year are estimated at a little over $100,000. That's for the passage of it. That will be built into the rates that we'll be paying. I met with um, uh, the Ms. Hastings from GBS today and we are looking at a double digit increase. Our, our health uh, run rate for this year had been as high as 109%, had gone down to 101, and it's leveling off at 105%. So one of the things people forget is insurance doesn't mean that you pay your premium uh, with us and then, uh, then the costs are paid by the insurance company. They are paid in whole by the health trust unless you go over $100,000 in claims, 
then the stop loss kicks in. If you go in for a doctor's visit and you pay a copay of $5 and there's a bill for 200, it isn't the insurance company eating 200, it is the health trust fund that pays $200. So that's just, um, we spoke today to, um, uh, I guess the term would be better educate ourselves and our employees and have the, uh, the members from Blue Cross and Harvard Pilgrim come down and hold some seminars on that so that people understand that uh, when, you, when you go to the, um, the ER and it, it's a thousand dollar visit, that again, it is not the insurance company's money, it is the health trust funds and money. Thank you. Well, Getting back to the 10-year snapshot, if you take the 1.4 million uh, increase from 2005 to, to, to 2014 in the retirement contribution, which is essentially a doubling of that number, and you take the 2.5 million increase in the medical insurance, it's, it's easy to see that essentially what we've done is transferred $3.9 million at minimum, just for those two items, out of operations, services for the townspeople and put them you know into this the, the, these two buckets if you will so this is why you have a 13 man municipal maintenance department this is why in the administration where there used to be five full town people full time people you've got three full time people and a part timer this is why uh, when people complain about potholes they don't get fixed quite as immediately as they might have in the past so this is, this is where the money's going. So this document is very useful in that regard. Uh, one of the things that we had discussed, I think, last year, I don't know that it ever really took on any life because we didn't have the initial money to invest. But I think that there was some discussion about savings that could be achieved if we handled the, the uh, health trust fund in a different fashion, if we went with different providers, it would not necessarily affect the benefits that the employees would receive, or certainly not their care, but it would be beneficial uh, to the town in terms of cost containment. And as I understand it, uh, and I'm hoping somebody can refresh my memory here, the big stumbling block was that we didn't have the cash to get in the door. 1.6 million, wasn't it? Yeah, price of 1.6 million. That's including, you need approximately a $1 million IBNR to be held. <coughs> Two years, yeah. Yeah. so speak up. Yeah. Uh, you would need approximately a one million dollar incurred but not reported. So you'd hold those. They would hold those funds uh, set aside, and that would be for two years. Uh, going to the it was the Mayflower, which is the old Plymouth County, which we were a part of. Uh, going to that doesn't necessarily save you money right off the bat. What it does do is prevents um, prevents if there was a surplus in the health trust fund as we have now but an even large one it prevents us from using those to to basically enhance our budget for one year it's it makes it uh, more practical and one of the things that we are forgetting is that last year the employees started with their cut of the health insurance um, and I mean a cut to to the town's cost and an increase to theirs. Uh, for FY14, it starts off going for the split from 75-25 to 70-30. <coughs> and then in FY15, it will go to 67 and a half, 32 and a half. It is a six year program. Over that time, it will save the town four and a half million. But it will take out of the employees' pockets, if you have a family plan, for uh, FY15, roughly $1,600. And if you're on a single plan, $540. So uh, on the health side, you know, besides what other uh, avenues we can take, the employees have worked with us to give back and giving back four and a half million to the town over six years. Which is what 60% over 10 years tells us, then, you know, despite the give back, we're still going to be expending more and more and more on this item. 
and at, at some point, you know, what do you, what are we, what are we going to be reduced to? Trying to negotiate contracts where we do not provide health insurance. Ultimately, at, the, at this trend, at six percent a year, you're there. In how many years? I mean, you're, Larry, you're the, you're the numbers guy. Oh, no, my numbers are gone right now. Yeah, but in 12 years, it, if you keep years, growing at six percent, 10 or 12 years, okay. then you, you cannot you cannot offer this any longer. So this this is really, I think, the the big elephant in the room that we've got to figure out, you know, how to fix how to keep it from screwing up the rest of the budget, because it absolutely does, and, and try to get some idea of how to contain it, while at the same time, you know, not, you know, jamming it all on the employees. In other words, trying to look for a better, more efficient system. So, you know, I don't have an answer to that. I can ask the question, but. Just to follow just real quick on that is, you know, one of the things that we had talked about is the school system is one of the, um, biggest employers in the town and um, right now or we haven't been at the table when it comes to negotiating with with the health care coverage and it's just something that we would like to ask for if the school side can actually be at the table when talking with the insurance providers because we might be able to not only and it's not just about being able to um, interject and in, you know provide ideas, which hopefully it would help, but also it allows us to be able to be in the know. So when we're going back and negotiating that we have all the information and then we can go back and, and help with the negotiations on our side also. Right now we haven't been at that table and I think that it would be beneficial to the town side also if we were. Yeah, the, the school was invited, the, the superintendent at the time and such, and we did, we did work the last superintendent and let them know about it so okay. um, and obviously the uh, who led the discussions because it's the largest group is the MTA so it was from and the agreement that we have is a six-year agreement now we can meet with the PEC and see if we would like to change some of some of the plants and such but there will not be any more drastic changes uh, so <coughs> Okay, so, um, you know, the retirement system was built on the idea that the average person lived 2.5 years beyond retirement. People live what now? 20, 30 years beyond? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> nice knowing you, Cliff. Cliff in particular. But believe it or not, I read the statistic, it was 2.5 years was Social the security. average was age time, of somebody. Well, but it doesn't matter. The system was built that way. So all the retirement things were based on that, and of course, as time went on, nothing changed. People, the retirement age didn't go up, nothing changed, and we kept throwing more and more money into it, and of course, that's a problem. The, the fact that healthcare keeps rising all the time, that's a problem. But it's the system that we're under that is the problem to begin with. Proposition two and a half is what's called phased in bankruptcy, okay? And, and everybody knew this from the very beginning. And I think people at home need to know this. Because the problem with it was that it wasn't equitable for the towns as a whole. If you took a town like Western Massachusetts, where I'm from originally, they have $8 million houses on every corner. They got a billion dollars, probably, or more in real estate levy base. So when they get a chunk of money, they get half the amount of people to deal with than we do. And they get millions of dollars every year in extra money to run the town. And they override Proposition 2.5 for schools on a regular basis. Okay, they spend more money than anybody else for schools. We started out, and look what our levy base is, $33 million. So we get a whole, boy, what, we get $815,000 in extra money to spend. And as we know, we already talked about 6%. I remember when I was on the FinCom when the number was double digits. I remember one year when it went up 21%. You can remember that. 21% in healthcare costs. So it's the system that's bad. And then of course, let's take the fact that it was, there was supposed to be no unfunded mandates, if you remember correctly. As part of Proposition 2.5, if the state mandated something, they had to pay for it. But what they do is they vote for it, and then they pass another resolution that exempts it from the position of Proposition 2 and a half. So we end up getting stuck with the unfunded mandates as well.
See, people, people at home really don't know this. They don't know the fact that, what, five years ago? No, almost 10 years ago now, right? 10 years ago, they devalued cranberry bogs by 50% because cranberry industry had had a fall because of Wisconsin. <coughs> when they did that, all that money shifted to all the residents. They picked up the extra taxes because that's how Proposition 2.5 works. You raise 2.5% over the levy before, if that money's in the levy, somebody else is paying it. That's all it means. That means all the residents ended up paying for that. So it's the system that we work under that's the problem. And I don't see how you get around the system. You know what I'm saying? So if it's the system, then we have to use the system to fix it. If the system says that the way around the system is that you have to go out there and prove to people that you need a, an override, then, you have, then that's what we have to do. It's as simple as that. If that's what the system is, and that's how it's designed, and that's what we live in, then that's what we have to do. And we, all of us, have to make that case. And I mean all of us. Yeah. Just, just, a, just a quick one here. Our local taxes have gone from 60.2% of the total revenue to 63.2, and the cherry sheets have dropped from 27.1 down to 26.8. So little by little, we're funding more, and the state is funding less, which is goes to what you were saying. Yep. So, you know, that's um, our, but our revenue in total is only increasing 3.1% versus the expenses, which are going up, well, we know 7% 7 or something along right. that line. Um, it's not override, it's revenue adjustment, just, just for the record. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you're right. It, it's not a question of the system's broke, but there, we can't fix it. It started in 1980. If I've read enough on it to know that it's not a system for a town like ours to, to get ahead. But you see a town like Bourne who's used the override to get to where they needed to go as well. The problem isn't isn't so much explaining it; it's explaining it in a way that the people will understand and trust us, because we, it's okay to vote at town meeting, and then it comes to the selectmen, and then the selectmen have to vote on whether to put it on the ballot. And once you get it on the ballot, then the people can vote. But it's not. Phew, thank God it's over, because now we have to show a level of physical responsibility, or we're not going to get out of this this jam. You can look for three million dollars in override money, and that's great. But if you don't use it properly, if we don't use it to repair our infrastructure, and no doubt there's probably still some cuts that need to be made to a certain degree in order to get to where we need to be in 10 years. We need to start now, but it's not just, it's to repair it and then prepare for the future. We need to start building you know, reserves. We need to get to the point that we're born where we got, I don't know, was it eight point something million dollars sitting back just in case something goes wrong? I mean, I'd like to have that, but we don't have that. We have no reserves. We're not funding our capital. Our infrastructure's down. So when people talk about operating, this isn't an operational override. This is something we need to do to fix the town going forward. Well, Bourne also took two and a half million dollars out of their enterprise fund. Yeah, I, and I transferred it to government. So that right. helped them a huge. All right, I'm done. I told you I wasn't going to talk tonight, and I lied. <laughs> Did you want to go first? Go first. Okay. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll um, I think that, um, you know, I sit as my fourth uh, time through this process, and I, I seem to say the same thing every year, and yet I'm not sure why whether I'm just all wet or it doesn't soak in. Um, the town of Wareham um, is not um, in that much of a fiscal hole that we can't support our town. And here's why. When you look at total revenue of Wareham, I'm talking about Wareham now, not government, not school, but the town of Wareham, we actually have quite a bit of money between our water districts, fire districts, government, school, and um, what's the one I'm missing? I'm missing one. Enterprise, uh, fund. Enterprise fund, thank you. When you take all of that money, and we're charging people for that already, 
uh, and people say, hey, I pay enough. And then you see the um, annual reports from the, all these different little enterprises that we have out there, right? Um, you're never going to get a, and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to be real here. You're not going to get people to go to a ballot box and say, I'm going to vote to raise my own taxes when there are balances in all these accounts, right? So I think I've mentioned the Rich Bowen. I see him over there with his little computer. I think I've mentioned it to him a few times that is there a way um, for the town of Wareham, all the four or five different entities, uh, to come together in whatever this number was, 2.9. Nine. What is it? 2.9, 2 .9, right? Thank you, Judy. Um, to come together and, and take a uh, bite, if you will, on the money we already collected and haven't spent. Uh, you know, could the, and just somebody mentioned people bringing suggestions to you. Can, for example, let's just say the Ontit Fire District. Can they bring an article to their uh, annual meeting that says, uh, I, vote to, I, I vote to approve a transfer of 500 grand uh, to the town of Wareham? Can they do that legally? Can somebody go to the Wareham uh, district and put an article on there that says, I vote to move 500 grand to the town of Wareham? If that's possible and legal, right? Uh, gift. We, we could be a gift and be accepted, and, you know, right? I mean, well, however, that works, right? My point is, it wouldn't be if we could do that legally somehow, a gift. I'm sure they can write a gift, depending on their rules. But is there a way to look at those funds that have balances that we've already collected from the taxpayers to try to solve some of this problem? I'm not saying it solves it all, but is there is there a way to do that? My second comment would be that, um, and again, four times around, we've talked about this over the last five or six weeks, that um, regionalization, we talk about regionalization. We kind of been regionalized in our own town between different departments. If, somebody's, um, if somebody is in the environmental services department, um, what difference does it make what building they're in doing their environmental services? If we're paying people to be perform environmental maintenance stuff, uh, we should be able to guide them through proper management to any building we own. If somebody is in the maintenance area <coughs> of any department, we should be able to manage that person to fix stuff that's either in a school building, in a town building, uh, on town property. We don't even do that. It's all separated. So when you go to the townspeople, these are the things you hear. Um, hey, you guys can't even combine your own services, but you want me to pay more so you can keep your own separate governments going. This is what you hear. Um, so I think that that's another area that in order to prove to the taxpayer that we're using their dollars wisely, and we may be, but in terms of this regionalization stuff, I think that you got to make some effort here as, as the school committee and the board of selectmen, town administrator, school superintendent. Um, if we don't make that effort, we lose a bunch of people. If we don't try to get money from another bucket, we lose that bunch of people. So when you go to the polls to vote for this, you lose. It's not just I'm not going to give them any more money. I don't feel that they're uh, using my current money wisely. My third point is over the health care issue. Um, uh, and I keenly pay attention to this because that is my business. And the companies, big companies in this country, um, a lot bigger than the town of Wareham, are starting to do a lot of things that um, maybe please the president, but uh, really tick off the employees is uh, one and they're starting not to cover their employees at all and throwing them into this deep hole which really um, if you like your employees it's not fair to do that because the cost is higher 
and you may lose your doctor, and, you, and there's all kinds of other things that go along with that. You pay more in a premium, you pay more in deductibles. Uh, it's not a very nice thing to do, but companies are doing that. The other thing is, is that companies are really beginning to turn, turn the tide on who they cover. So um, if you're a single person, you get a single plan. If you're a married person with a family, you get a single plan. No more family coverage. And they start to knock off spouses, kids, and all that other sort of stuff. So, um, you know, is that drastic? I don't know. But you have to look at the way companies are managing their businesses to stay afloat. And that's one way that they're doing it is they're just covering the employee. And the family now can go to gov.org um, and try to survive for themselves. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it's such a great deal for people. I'm fortunate and blessed to have health insurance through my company. Um, if that was to change, well, that would be a problem. So, you know, just off the top of my head, you know, you talk about what people are saying to you. The other question that uh, came up, somebody had called me this past week, was over the Old Rochester Regional School. And um, is, I don't know, it's just a question. I don't know the answer. That's why I'm going to throw it out. Is there a way, uh, Madam Superintendent, to limit the number of students that you allow to go to that school? No. So, you know, if, if 500 wanted to go, you'd have to allow that? They have to Say it again. No, but we pay per student to go to that school, correct? Yes, right. but because of school choice uh, from the state level, we do not get to choose how many students go. OR decides how many wear him students that they'll accept. So it's basically the money coming out of your pocket. Correct. So if you only have $1,000 to spend, right, you can only spend $1,000. And nobody can they force you to spend more than that is, I guess, my question. And that's the question from the person. Yes, they take it out in our assessment. It's school choice tuition out and so that's taken out prior to us receiving the funds okay yeah because that was a question somebody asked and they're saying well why can't we just say hey we can afford 100 students a year from your mm -hmm. your budget right and so that's all you allow is 100 and over 100 you know you can't go you have to come here yes, so you don't have an option there no okay. thank you uh. All right. Um, I don't know, it's, and I, I appreciate what Steve was saying there, but um, as far as the districts are concerned, um, I don't know that they have any big pots of money. I know that the, the Wareham Fire Water District has money they collect through the use of fees on their water system that they use to put aside to build another well and do things like that and do whatever. I also know that the districts are not restricted by Proposition 2 and a half. They have no restriction. They need money. They can get money. There's nothing we can do about it. They, have, they do not have the restrictions that we have. Uh, as far as them writing us a check, that's not going to happen. I mean, they, they run their entities. We run our entities. Uh, nobody can expect that. I mean, uh, you know, it's just, that's just not realistic. As far as the town having a pot of money, I'd like to know where it is because uh, I've never seen a pot of money. And, I, I, and as far as our enterprise fund is concerned, uh, that's governed by law, what we can take and what we can do as far as the enterprise fund. If there's a pot of money there, it's supposed to go back to the rate users. The only monies that we can save are monies that we're saving either for an upgrade or something of that nature or, or some, you know, but as far as saving a pot of money, you have to give it back to the users. And once upon a time, we used to take money from the enterprise fund that helped fund the budget, $980,000, in fact. And boy, all of a sudden, it became a big to-do, and we gave back the $980,000. I don't know, you weren't here, Derek, at the time, but this was back in, well, we used to do it as a regular course. We used it through admin fees. We used to take some money and help sort of with the budget. And you can see it. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the 2005 thing. If you look at it, you'll see it right there. Uh, it's, I think it was nine. It was nine hundred eighty thousand dollars at its peak. I just remember that number. Uh, my my fellow colleagues that sat on the board back there remember how that was done. And then uh, some people uh, got got 
upset about it, and ultimately that was reduced, and that 980,000 came out, which, by the way, is part of our problem as well, because we took that 980 away from us, which was reoccurring money, and we also took away the growth factor, where we were getting that new growth because the economy was flying so high, so we took that out of the economy, out of our budget too, which, of course, has caused us more headaches, as everybody knows. But there's really no pots of money, and I, I don't want people at home to think that there's pots of money sticking around someplace that we can just all of a sudden take money out whenever we need it, because they just don't exist. There is none of those pots of money. And even the districts have to earmark money. They can't just hold money and say, well, we're going to keep this money and grow this pot of money. They can't do that. They're, they're just like we are. If you, you have to either give it back or you've got to have it earmarked for specific use and I know the water district in particular is needs to build a new well and the reason they need to do that is because we need new water supplies all the time and they are getting ready to do that and that's why they've been saving a few dollars over there and if they have a little pot of money that's all what it is and they are going to be building a new well very shortly uh, they do a really good job over there I know I sat with them I've talked to them I'm sort of the district rep I've spent some time with both of the, well, actually I haven't got to answer to be honest with you, but I will. Um, and um, we've spent some time, so, but I, there's just no pots of money out there. And I don't want people at home to think that there are, because there are not pots of money that we can just call on reserves. Okay. Thank you. Cliff? <coughs> Thank you, um, i just ask everyone to, yeah. ask everyone to sort of bear with me. Um, I have a tendency to get a little long-winded, but I'll try to keep the shots <laughs> at the end. Okay. Well, your, chairman just, your chairman just showed me the time, and it's approaching 10 after 7, so she may cut you off if uh, nobody else does. And she's done that before, too, but I respect I'm, her. I'm sure she has. Um, I, I've, I've listened, and I, I've been quiet, and uh, I, I just think that we've got a multitude of issues here. And this, this I'd like to put up a couple of uh, uh, caution lights, if, if you will. Um, the most important thing for me is um, we, we, can't, we can't lay blame. We, we can't approach this budget from a blame perspective. We can't make our public employees and the people that provide service to our citizens the culprits, whether it be health care or anything else. You know, we are paying folks to do a job, uh, whether it be working on municipal maintenance, whether it be being a police officer, an ambulance driver, or an EMT, or whatever. We are pay, paying people for, to do a job, and these people, for the most part, are dedicated to what they do, dedicated to the citizens of Wayham. So it, it really, really bothers me that people out there could get the idea that our problems lie at the feet of our public employees. And I, I don't want that perception to be out there. I don't think anyone in this room believes that. But I just don't want that to get out there that, you know, that is the problem. Sure, we've got a real health care problem in this country. Uh, the town of Wayham, along with a, a whole lot of other municipalities, states, and, of course, the national government. So I think that uh, we have to sort of recognize the fact now that we've got an immediate problem. And, you know, we have done, I've heard, uh, you know, some really, really good ideas and some really good hypotheses and some really good uh, strategies. But the bottom line is where I'm coming from uh, as a 70-year-old man, a uh, former public employee, is the fact that we've got an immediate problem that's going to require immediate action. And I just don't think that we can just sit back and say, well, we're going to kick, down, kick the can down the road another year. I don't think that's possible. And this is why I don't think it's possible. Most of our uh, contracts, uh, th at least those that, are, that we've already negotiated, uh, in terms of the health care, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Sullivan, are pretty much cast in granite, for at least for a while. We have the process of this year. Right. So, you know, that, that is a problem that is not going to easily go away. So we, may, we can wish that we didn't have that problem, or we could wish that there were some solutions to that problem. But the bottom line is there is an immediate need associated with that problem. And we have to address that need. That need is not going to go away. Um, and, you know, again, let's, let's try not to make our public employees, the culprits here, because we know, everyone in this room knows that there's inequities in terms of the folks that work for the town, the folks that work for the school system, and the folks that work for the districts. The, their fringe benefit packages are not the same. And, and so I think that even though it's adding to the problem, we have to address the problem immediately, and it's a revenue problem. That's what we've got. We've got a revenue problem. And we, I 
personally believe that we've got to address this problem on the revenue side of the ledger. I don't think there's any other way to address it. But by so doing, we've got to be honest with the people in Wayham. We've got to be honest with the citizens of Wayham. And I think, I do believe, that the citizens of Wayham have an awful lot more trust in our elected boards than they've had in the past. I think this Board of Selectmen has a, a level of credibility and trust that has really, really increased since these members have been on this board. I think we've got a town administrator that's open, honest, and dedicated to his position. And I think that the people in town recognize that, Mr. Sullivan. I think that we've got a school committee that is committed to providing the best possible education for our kids. And we hate to see our kids and families moving their children out of the town of Wayham because I, for one, still believe there is a quality education at hand in the town of Wayham. So I think all of these problems exist, but I think the problem is now, it's immediate, and it's a revenue problem. And the most important thing that we can do right now for the town of Wayham is to come up with a cooperative strategy that everybody can get behind and get out there to our community members and let them know all of us, let them know how important it is for them to support this strategy, whatever that strategy may be. This has got to be something that we all get behind, because if we're divided on this right now, there is no solution. The only solution is receivership from where I sit right now. And I've worked under receivership in the state of Rhode Island. It's not a pretty picture. So I think that the most important thing that I will commit to, and I hope that everyone in this room commits to, is whatever we come up with a solution, let's all get behind it. And let's all get out there and put a positive spin on it to our community members. And let's, let's be honest with them. And I, you know, I think that a lot of what's been said is true. Um, so I think that um, in terms of uh, selling it, we can sell it. I know we can. And I know we can come up with a decent solution. But I think the solution is now, and it has to be done now. And I honestly think the solution is a rev we have a problem, and the problem is a revenue problem. And we've got to deal with that immediately, because it's not going to go away. Because some of the things that we're dealing with right now are cast in granite, and they won't change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Larry. Thank you. I think everyone addressed most of the points that I would have brought up previously. Um, and it's a little premature because actually due to weather, um, the F Finance Committee has not met with this budget yet. So tomorrow night I think we have our work cut out for us. Um, we've already talked about the agenda. And it actually seems like at the beginning of this meeting what we're going to do from here in has been outlined. We need to look at this budget with $2.9 million worth of cuts. And I'd like to remind you that these three boards sat together last year. We couldn't come up with a balanced budget. And I believe those cuts were 840 something thousand dollars that hurt greatly. Does anyone really think we can come up with three times that amount in cuts, given that the cuts that were already taken last year? So we will do it. We will do it as an exercise, because ultimately it will be up to the people of the town to approve a budget. So we will prepare a budget with the assistance of the town administrator and I assume the superintendent is going to work. We're going to sharpen our pencils. I hate that expression, but we're going to look at everything that can be cut. And we're going to put a budget out there that is going to be beyond painful. And it's not going to reflect a town that I want to live in with no library, no services that we can point to. And knowing that it's only one year, because the next year the same thing's going to happen. And then we're going to put together a budget that's realistic to try to figure out how to get out of this hole. So echoing everyone else's sentiments, that's the work that we have to do. And I expect that... We also have the half a million dollars this year. Hmm? Oh, the half a million dollars from this year that we're still trying to make up. So, yeah. So we have a lot of numbers to put together. I, I thank everyone's patience, but I also really appreciate the fact that these three boards are sitting in this room together, working together on the problem. Thank you. Thank you. So... Um, some of you know I'm all about not walking out of room unless there's next steps. It's the nails down a chalkboard for me That's because true. just going out and you know us all making statements and and, and no 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 I got my and, job tomorrow no no, no. and valid 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 statements yeah, and I think absolutely. there were a lot of good ideas that came out of this. One of the I'm just going to put something out there. One of the the um, 
things that I heard, and not from everybody on the board, and I, I echo uh, Cliff's point regarding, you know, it, you can't get behind a plan unless there's actually a plan in place. But the one thing that has come up several different times is about bringing new revenue, and it's a revenue adjustment, not an override. But, but that if as, if as these three committees, the only way to get behind the idea of selling a revenue adjustment, I know that it would be hard for me to do it unless I saw the plan on how we might go about selling that. And I always start from the end result is that we need a ballot question. We need um, what's going to go in front of town meeting voters. We need, so then how do we get, how do we work backwards from that? So if it's open forums, if it's transparency, if it's documentation that needs to be held. From the school side, every single time there's been a request that's come in regarding a piece of data, that's been transparent and put up on our website. And I think that that's starting to build some trust for the people that actually want to go and download it and actually dive into it. They're starting to see that what is really being said is, is there. So, if we basically come up with this plan, and I'm looking for volunteers around this table, I will absolutely lead, not lead, but basically you know, help put this document together. But to come up with a plan between now and April with the tasks that need to happen from open forums to sharing of documentation to ballot question to um, everything, basically a step-by-step -step process of what is needed to hopefully get the information in town, um, town voters' hands. So the only way that we're going to do it is not the last time that we went for a debt, a debt exclusion and override where we just said, shh, and then all of a sudden there was a pop, there was a question on the ballot question. There needs to be a communication plan that leads all the way up to it so then there is some sort of shot of town meeting voters really understanding what the problems are in this town and that there is a revenue problem and how we can actually get a vote there. So. I, just, just okay I'm sorry well just this just, just briefly we haven't had our meeting yet and we will tomorrow night and uh, but we have already started the, the framework and then it's going to be a question of working with everybody but you need to also remember that the warrant closes on a certain date and we have to have an article in there before that closes now that doesn't mean we have to have a finished product before that closes but we need to have a war uh, an article in there then for that, that all the dates and everything right go into the right and at that point you're still looking to finish up the framework after the fact before you go to town meeting then you have the time till april to do it but you need that in yes. there so what we have from our standpoint which we'll talk about tomorrow is developing not just a framework but coming up with some sort of a number and and a, and a plan to get to that number and what that number means so I'm, I'm willing to work with anybody in my limited time that I have. I will work with, with anybody that wants to work on it. But I think we've already set some of the groundwork, and it might behoove some people to come to our meeting tomorrow to talk and listen to what we have to say because we really haven't had a chance to discuss it yet. I think we're also missing the uh, fourth leg of our chair, which is the Capital Planning Committee. Well, they're coming involved. next Wednesday yeah. to our meeting. So. So. Excellent. Could I just say one last thing? Um, I, I know uh, I've heard the word salesmanship sort of used a couple of times and although I appreciate you know what you're trying to say I don't think we're, we have to sell anything I think this is right and just and that when we all in this room come up with a plan that is that we want to go forward with whatever that plan is I think there's so many heads in here there's been so much will be so much work involved that uh, we won't have to sell anything. We'll have it. We'll all be behind it, and we'll make it happen. And so I, I'd like to not use that word, because I don't think we need to sell anything to anybody. I think what we need to do is inform, for sure, but not sell. Good word. Okay. Thank you. Although I appreciate fully what you're saying, Patrick, um, I think there's another dimension to this to this problem which really put needs to be put out on the table and that is if we compare let's born did three overrides during the 1990s you can't compare 2014 to the 1990s for the typical middle-class family Correct. the fact is the amount of discretionary income and the problems that people are having are just keeping 
food on the table and roofs over their head are far greater now than they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And so what we're really asking them to do is take some of their limited discretionary income and give it to us to use in a way that we think is a slam dunk better use of their money than allowing them to keep it. I don't take for granted that that's an easy sell. I do believe it is a sell. I think it's a difficult sell, and I think we need to be prepared for it to be rejected. I, I just, I just, I understand what you're saying, but I think salesmanship has a bad connotation with it. Anytime you tell somebody you're trying to sell them something, it just brings up the wrong thing for me. And I don't think I need to sell people anything. I think I need to tell them, inform them, make them understand why. I think that this is the necessary thing, why I want them to give them the money, why I want them to trust in me. I want all that to happen. But I don't think I need to sell them anything. I think that it's a communication plan that helps educate and inform, but ultimately uh, convince and get people to thank you. Um, it, it's to understand that, that this is actually good. Yes. For them, so well, it's a matter of persuasion. I think is maybe the word is, is maybe the middle ground between uh, presenting information and selling. It, well, it is a big difference, but I mean, I really think that you know, if you're going to, you know, per se persuade, what you need to do is to create the this or that scenario, and that's going to be what I understand the FinCom exercise is going to be tomorrow night. If you're going to cut 2.9 million dollars. Where is it coming from? What does the budget look like if we go into town meeting uh, based upon the current revenue projections? What is the, quote, balanced budget, unquote, going to look like? What is going to be lost? Uh, what is not going to be gained, which is a, a different way of saying the same thing, but in terms of capital? Uh, and where does this leave the town next year? I'd like people to look five years down the road and see where it really leaves the town. Does it mean that the uh, state is coming in here and taking us over at that point? We know it's not going to happen next year. Probably won't happen the year, the year after that. At what point do we belly up to receivership? Because I think eventually we're going to get there. Um, no, I, I agree with that approach. And uh, Mr. Sweat said earlier. Speak up. I, I agree with that approach and uh, what Mr. Sweat said earlier about having a contingent uh, budget, have two budgets at town meetings, so it, so it is real. Um, but I, I also uh, want to touch on what Madam Chair had said, too, about the transparency and having everything online. And, and I'd like to see everything that was handed out here today on the town website somewhere, if that's okay. Mr. Flaherty, it's a no-brainer. It happens anyways once it's presented to the, to the Board of Selectmen. The, uh, these budget documents as well as the others. The only reason it hasn't happened is the last two meetings we've had one snowstorm and one there was only three members of the Board of Selectmen. So I appreciate the question and I'm not trying to get hot under the collar. Oh no, it, I wasn't I wasn't trying it is, uh, it is something that we I was just being very matter did, of fact. So. I'm sorry. I just no, I just <laughs> like I like I like to point people to things and, and it's tough when I don't know where, where they are. So if, if this is going to go up, that would be great. What I think is, uh, and I think to, to your point, is often people tell me it's hard to find these on the, uh, on the town website. So whether you look under administration or it's under accounting, but um, in the upper right-hand corner are usually the new documents. So I think Matt is available, to, can put a... Um, a yellow warning sign almost on there, which maybe that's very appropriate for this budget. So, <laughs> okay. By the way, when I was growing up, I always thought the superintendent controlled the weather, so you maybe. <laughs> Pete, before you close, could you go back, Jeff? If you wouldn't mind, um, go back to the beginning where you were talking about what three million dollars equated to per taxpayer. Not per house, but you know, not no, per family, but it's not per, per taxpayer. It's not per, the money. The, the, it was per median household, because that's the tax way we the we ta we tax based on property. We don't ta tax based on the number of people who live in the property. So right, but you also don't tax the people that necessarily live in the property. You're taxing the homeowners. That's correct. Right. One one bill, regardless of the number of people that are there. Oh, got for, it. Right, and that works out. A couple of years ago, it worked out to a little, uh, a little over $60 per million. 
What was it last year? You remember when we did for the roof and all that? Do you remember what that was? No, I wasn't. I wasn't talking about because that was a debt exclusion, and, and those were. Those but were we had some. Wasn't there some overrides? Yes. In there, in no, there, there were debt exclusions. And all? All. There was one override. Oh, there was one override. Yes. Five. I thought there yes. was. The numbers haven't changed that much. It's I'm about sure two hundred dollars for three million. Think of it as in round numbers: two hundred dollars for three million for the for the median household. Then, to my colleague's point, Patrick, I got to tell you, uh, fifty dollars a week for somebody. Is that what it is? Two hundred dollars a per year, year per year. Per year. Per year. Four bucks. Maybe week. you don't have to sell. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I got to tell you, you have to address all those, Absolutely. all those Absolutely. other factors because. Okay. And I'd just like to chime in and remind people that okay, in improving the town, we're also improving our real estate values. Absolutely. I mean that that is the big Absolutely. thing that we're looking at. We're giving you something that's really intangible. I can't put a value on that per se, but what those two hundred dollars are buying you in the long run you is remember, equity in your home. I think you just you just have to remember that you're trying to talk to, I forget what the number was that came out. But you have an election. People have to come out. Um, only those people that come out are going to vote, right? Um, so you're talking about a small percentage. A lot of those don't have kids in school, right? You have, you have all these things. I don't use water. I don't use police. I don't use the school system. And I'm voting no. So you have to really, there is a salesmanship to it. I understand what Patrick's saying, but um, you're going to have to go a lot better than the last time. We'll tell even, them what they're getting for their buck. That's to all. even try right. to get it. To, and, and the to one thing that I'll say to that is if the, that at the end of the day, we are all not mind readers. And so if there is a piece of information or a question that you have about the budget of any line item, it is important to be able to get to the right people to get an informed answer instead of forming an opinion. There are several pieces of data out there, and you can cut it up m multiple ways. We have responded, and I know the town administrator has too, responded to requests as best that we can, but if there is a piece of information that is preventing someone to understand the, the difficult position that this town is in right now, then I will just ask people to ask that question, get the information, and make an informed they, they have to actually get the information from us somehow and not from the coffee shop. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we can work with Mr. Sullivan to create a clearinghouse, so, so to speak, on the town website. They have that kind of information. Perhaps it's time to have a direct link, just as we do for, you know, Board of Selectmen, town departments, town committees, town budget. There's nothing wrong with doing that. We so. have a new website where all of our budget documents are right up there. So we're happy to help link, too. Okay. I think we need to, to wrap it up here. Uh, going forward, I know you would want a plan. I think what we do is we wait for the FinCom to, to do theirs. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to be able to attend tomorrow night, but I'll certainly watch. Stirring tomorrow night? Well, you're, you're stirring tomorrow night, and based upon that, we can come up with an agenda no, and I for the next that time then around. I think we can report back based on the communication that's coming out and what those <laughs> next steps are. So, okay. okay. Actually, we may be live, and that's uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bob White. I don't know if we're going live tomorrow night or not. So, no. so are you saying, Mr. Chairman of the FinCom, <laughs> that yeah, tomorrow doing? night you're going to begin to put together, without, without any review at all, of the new budget, you're putting together an override proposal? Is that what I heard you say? No, that's not what you heard us say. What you heard us say was we were going to review the budget and the parameters, start building the options, because you're looking at options here. Right. Uh, a $2.9 million cut. We're, we're in the process of building that, but as far as what I said earlier was that we're starting with the framework of it because we are certainly not the ones that are going to have to fill in the framework. That would be coming from the two. We're an advisory committee. We don't uh, tell you guys what to do. We right. advise well, you. And I was then just trying to clarify that because it sounded like you were putting the framework together. With no other discussion, you haven't seen it, you haven't met. Well, that's not, that's not true. We haven't seen it because it was all forwarded out well now it's a new budget now thanks to the extra right. thing but uh that it was electronic like already pre-determined what well the that was from. just your perception of it that wasn't yeah. what we said that's what i heard and we suffered oh. through about eight hours of meetings last thursday yeah, and, so. and i don't think your administrators <laughs> would like the word suffer <laughs> <laughs> and we did spend we did spend the entire day talking to each one of the department heads so we do have a pretty good understanding of where we're at and what they require to get their jobs done so they, they've already started their process through the budget hearing so they're, they're not coming into this 
the budget document cold. It just sounded like that was the yep. default switch. Nope. Default you, switch. Well, to the, to the extent that that was the impression, I think it's been allayed. Uh, is there anything else? We're out here. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy way to adjourn. I wish we could be let that I informal. Just I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, we'll, we'll close the special meeting and open the regular meeting. Yeah, you want to make a motion? Second. And second. Motion made by Selectman Torpiano, seconded by Selectman Whiteside. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 5-0-0. We're good. Thank you and good night.